you're just joining us, uh, I think a few people are coming through now. We've just opened the webinar. So we're going to leave it maybe another 30 seconds or a minute to uh, let people in. Uh, it's the end of the day, so appreciate it. People have probably got to-do list they haven't even started, suddenly realize what time it is and need to crack on with those. So we might have a few people coming in late, but really appreciate your time for those that have joined already. Welcome, Anthony, Avril, Ella, and Tasman. Thanks so much for signing up for this event. We're going to uh, kick off in a second, as I mentioned. Um, I'm joined by Alex and Victoria, as you can see here. Uh, full disclosure, I actually work with Alex. We have different backgrounds. We're in different locations. So in addition to being the um, chair of the broadcast group at the PRCA and sitting on the council, so deputy MD of the broadcast specialist marketeers, at which Alex is one of the senior, senior newsroom producers. And I've been very lucky to work with Victoria and her team for a little while. So now a bit about this campaign, which is why I thought it'd be a really good one for us to talk through and hopefully share some really useful um, learnings, advice, takeouts, which might help with your own pitching in future. So we'll give it a few more seconds, see a few more people still coming in, and then we will kick off. What I will say is I've um, uh, prepared some questions for Alex and Victoria, which will help us kind of get under the bonnet of this campaign. What was it about? Why did it work? And 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 what were the assets? What were the, the techniques used that made this really land from a broadcast perspective? And that's the kind of stuff I'm hoping you guys will really benefit from, from hearing. You won't always have this type of story to work with. You won't always have these assets to work with either, but you'll hopefully be able to take out elements which will be relevant to the kind of work you are doing or will be doing in the future. Um, if you have questions yourself though, please do pop them in the chat. Um, I'll probably come to those at the end, but if there's anything particularly pressing relevant to what we're talking about in the moment, I'll try and capture that from the chat and, and feed it into the conversation. But we're gonna have a fairly open conversation probably for 10, 15 minutes, just between Victoria, Alex and myself. And then we'll open it up to questions from you guys, which could be a combination of entered during the conversation or entered afterwards. But I think it's probably time for us to crack on. It's already been dark for about an hour here, so probably need to get on with it. Um, also, big thanks as well to anybody that's on the on this who signed up for the physical event in Manchester. Um, we had to pivot to a, a Zoom event, so I really appreciate um, you joining if you have done and apologies for any inconvenience if you had planned your day around it but thank you for those that signed up perhaps today seeing that it's a zoom event and could attend as such <clears throat> so on with the uh, the event um i'm talking today to uh, these guys obviously about the uh the, the license to loot co-op campaign um for a bit of background the uk is experiencing somewhat of a shoplifting epidemic at the moment um thefts have more than doubled in the past three years, costing retailers £953 million a year, according to the British Retail Consortium. And the co-op has seen crime, shoplifting and antisocial anti behaviour jump 35% year on year, with more than 175,000 incidents recorded in the first six months of this year. That's almost 1,000 incidents every single day. So given the scale of the problem and with staff being threatened by shoplifters with razors, knives, hammers, even needles, what are you to do as a retailer and what role can PR play? To discuss this and how broadcast media was used, I'm delighted to be joined by Victoria Simons, Senior PR Business Lead at the Co-op, and Alex Williamson, Senior Newsroom Producer from Marketeers. Thank you both. Really appreciate your time. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, Victoria, I want to kick off maybe if we could ask you to tell us a bit about yourself, maybe your role, your team, uh, what you do at the Co-op, please. Yep, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm really lucky to lead uh, a team in Cop Food. So I lead the um, food PR team there. So there's six of us now. Uh, yeah, six of us now. Um, and we're one half the team. The other half of the team is uh, the other Cop businesses, which you may know as funeral care and legal services and a bit of the corporate team as well. So um I would say that our job in the food team is 70% uh, trying to get us into the newspapers and online and broadcast and 30% trying to keep us out of the uh, media, which I would imagine uh, most PRs would recognise as a split that you have to manage uh, through your day-to-day um, -day job. So on the sort of 70%, the proactive stuff, we do lots of uh, campaigns. So as you imagine, we're a food retailer, convenience retailer. So we do a lot of stuff around trying to get people to write about our food and our wine and our products and um, so that's you know some of the nicer stuff I guess of, um, of the job um, and then 
being co-op, we have quite a lot of other areas that we will do PR for. So whether that's sustainability or climate change or ethical retailing or sourcing or animal welfare seems to take up an awful lot of my time um, on, uh, on our policies there. So we have, I suppose, a nice mix between the more sort of lighter PR stuff in food and then the more serious stuff on uh, some of the policies. And then obviously we do some campaigning work, which this is what uh, one of the ones we'll talk about today. Um, so that, and that gives us a whole sort of different um, way of using PR to make a real difference to the business. So I've been at the co-op for nine and a half years now, but my career has been in PR um, ongoing. I used to work at Boots um, before I was at the co-op. Right. Lovely stuff. And when did you mentioned, you know, part of the role is campaigning and this falls into that. But when did the topic, if you like, of shoplifting become a comms priority? It's probably been there in the background for a long time, but obviously it's been elevated recently by those levels yeah, of incident yeah, yeah. that we talked about. So a couple of years ago, we did a campaign called Safer Colleagues, Safer Communities, which was around very much focused on protecting our workers, our colleagues in the stores, um, because at that time they were seeing quite a rise in abuse, so verbal abuse and physical violent abuse. So um, we didn't focus on the, the theft element of that campaign. It was very much around trying to get some laws changed to protect our, our store colleagues. Um, so we had a bit of a legacy in this kind of area and we knew that it was something that actually wasn't getting any better, even though we had managed to get some laws changed. But actually, at the same time, we were seeing this huge increase in theft. Um, so we knew there was a chance to go again, if you like, but actually with a fresh take on it because of the new issues that were arising. Um, so we started, well, we launched the campaign in July. I'd say we started planning it probably sort of March time uh, was when we started to think about, OK, what could this look like? What is the business going to do and what can we PR from it? Because I think, you know, it's really important. And I'll say to the team always, You've got to, we can only PR what the business have got us to PR. And so the business has to be doing something. Otherwise, you've got quite an empty story. Mm -hmm. um, and that can apply across the board. You know, we need to be launching new pizzas so we can PR new pizzas. You can't just PR pizzas if you haven't got new ones. With this, it's very much the same. The business had a mission to try and make a difference in our stores because our colleagues in the stores are suffering financially we're suffering we're spending an awful lot of money trying to protect our stores and our colleagues and there's a limit to how much we can do as a retailer and then actually what happens outside of the store and what the police are doing or not doing and so there's an opportunity there to really highlight that so that's when we we decided to go it was in July. That's great and, and not saying that New pizzas aren't important, but obviously the mission of this is extremely important. So presumably the stakeholders reflected that. It was probably pretty pretty senior down in terms of people involved yeah, no, in this. Yeah, it was the most senior. So um, of our stakeholders, because it you know it, it's a really serious topic because it affects people's lives. Mm -hmm. And the the colleagues in our stores are somebody's mum or dad or brother or uncle or cousin or son or daughter, and so. Um, it's just not, uh, you know, something that we can, with all clear conscience, not do anything about. So um, our CEO was involved um, in terms of, yeah, this is what we want to do. Um, but then for me, we have a, an MD for the food business. But we also, the part of the campaign that we PR'd a lot of was the sort of uh, the more the political public affairs side of things, because actually there's a call to action in this campaign for the police to make a change to the way they respond to crime. So one of my main stakeholders was our Director of Policy and Public Affairs, um, a guy called Paul Gerrard. And if you've seen any of the, the coverage that we achieved, Paul was very much out in front and centre as our spokesman. Um, and he liaises with politicians all the time. So getting stakeholders on board when you've got a subject like this is so important because you need their backing. Because, and when I go into a bit more detail about what we did, this was a campaign where we had to be really brave and mm -hmm. um, we were actually putting ourselves out there if you like um and putting our heads above the parapet uh where others haven't spoken now that's great because it actually gives you a real being really passive, a, bit, yeah. a bit of a sort of advantage um from a pr point of view but equally it's also quite scary to be the one out there saying some of the stuff particularly where we are you could perceive we were criticizing the police 
and you know and that wasn't our intention that was almost a byproduct really of what we were trying to say so you need to make sure you've got your stakeholders lined up behind you to to make sure that they are you know you've got their support for what you're going to go out and say so it tells us a bit about it so you had that that you suggested kind of three four month planning period and so it sounds like a lot of that was getting all of these different stakeholders bought in liaising with them to make sure that the positioning I guess of what you're saying is tied completely to that call to action but also whilst minimizing the risk of it being misinterpreted or sounding yeah. too accusational yeah no absolutely. Tree, sorry. I think it's I mean the the, the planning is to, there's two real parts and it's the same for any real camp PR campaign is that you've got to get your story you know what is your story um, and for us we always try and start with our headline and a bit of the top like you know the top paragraph what could that say could that get us a story and then for us we always write what it is we'd like to be able to say and then we go back to the business and say how can we support this what what evidence do we have that this will that we could make this true um and you know um the business will give us the facts, but as PRs, we've got to make that appealing to the media because sometimes the facts that come through are quite dry and it's about making it interesting. You know, uh, we all talk about getting the hook, don't we? We need the hook to, to, to get us started. So what is the hook for this story? Um, and so for us, it we, were, we sort of landed on this um, element of looting. Now, it's quite an emotive word, the fact is it reflected directly what we were seeing in stores. We're not talking here about somebody that goes in and steals a sandwich because they're a bit hungry and they can't, you know, um, afford to buy a sandwich. The, the crimes that are being committed are organised gangs and perpetual repeat offenders. So the perpetual repeat offenders are generally addicts, um, drugs or alcohol mainly, and they're coming in to steal, to sell on, to get cash, to buy, get their next fix. Um, the crime gangs are there also to steal, but in quantity. So they, if you imagine, they will go into a shop and they will scoop the whole shelf off or they will go and open the chillers and they'll steal all the meat in the chillers. Um, and then there's, it's onward sold. So, you know, it might be sold in a pub car park. It might be sold um, in a market. It actually sometimes is sold in more independent, small retailers, um, down a back street kind of thing so um, that's the kind of theft we're talking about we've had examples of people coming in I mean the worst example is we've had somebody come into a store in London with a wheelie bin you know like your black bin out oh, your garden yeah, yeah. Um, dragged it into the store lit up filled it lit down dragged it out again um, and you know they come in with big builder bags they just there is no you know shame in in what they will steal so we had, um, you know, that makes a very compelling story um, because it's people are a bit like, like you, like, oh, my God, you know, really? Wow. Um, and so when you get a bit of a wow factor to a story, and I feel really bad saying it was a really good story for us because obviously it's about a really bad thing. But if you look at it from purely through a PR view, it was a good story because it had lots of elements yeah. to it and it had some fantastic stats behind it, really strong, high figures. So you have that sort of combination of emotive language, looting, criminal gangs, perpetual, you know, repeat offenders, violence. But then you've also got these figures of, you know, plus 35% year on year, a thousand incidents a day, you know, and it's actually only rising. So they all play if you imagine your top line and your top paragraph to put all of those in there it's a very compelling read for a journalist that's great I think that point about language and positioning is really really useful to hear and important so shoplifting almost even if you talk about the scale of it it potentially downplays the severity of the situation whereas if you use a word like looting which is not as commonly perhaps used it, it, it nods a bit more to the actual severity of the, the situation. Yeah. Alex, I'm conscious I haven't asked you anything yet and you've been sitting there very patiently for a quarter of an hour. So let's bring you in because um, there's a few things there you probably want to kind of talk around as well. But can you start just by telling the guys uh, that have joined us for this conversation a bit about you, please, and, and your team? Uh, about the, Yeah, so I'm a uh, senior newsroom producer here at Marketeers and help run the, our newsroom team here. Um, 
I've been here for now four and a half years. Uh, but before it, before this, actually, my background isn't PR. It's actually my background is radio. I was a uh, hot breakfast producer for 15 years before before um, joining Marketeers. And actually, that's sort of what a lot of our team is as well. It's not necessarily the PR background. Our newsroom team has that journalistic background. We've got people that have done, whether it's uh, Talk Sport or Sky News that they've done. We have someone that joined us this year from uh, from GB News. It's It's more those people that know what the journalists are looking more and what the, and what they want rather than that PR side of things. So it works really well um, when we're selling those bits in, but um, yeah, yeah I guess, four I guess. and a half years has flown by. <laughs> man and boy, man and man. <laughs> um, the, um, to that end, and that Victoria's touched upon it quite a bit there in terms of the assets, which made this really land for media, you know, strong stats, great headline, emotive language. Were there any other assets attached to this campaign, which for you, and this is after a broadcast group event, made it so successful for broadcast what were those assets and how did you approach the think, pitching so it's, it's so it's so it's everything victoria mentioned um and but and more so the other stuff that, that that i think really that did resonate so well with this is also the footage that we had the flexibility of timings the the different locations you're able to film or the different store managers in different locations that you were able to talk to and then collating all those different assets for the right media outlet is what then worked for those different broadcasters. Um, I, I sort of go on to, I think for, for example, so for the likes of the bits that Victoria mentioned, that a thousand incidents a day, the 30, 35% rise year on year, those, those news grabbing pieces right at the top that you, that you can hear before you've pitched it, you can hear it within the new, a news bulletin. So the, the pitch there to, to places like, you know, the, the Sky News Radio or those regional heart, stations regional capital stations the, the news pieces you almost pitch that as the bulletin piece there's been this 35 percent rise year on year there's been so many these many incidents a thousand incidents a day and for this one i know we, we had kate graham um director of stores do an interview for sky news radio the day before the campaign and um, the day before the embargo lifted knowing that they would distribute that for the commercial network as well but then when you get so that's those those headline pieces that Victoria mentioned. But then when you when you move down and, and you begin pitching to the likes of of BBC Breakfast or or GMB or, or or even BBC Radio Five Live, it's those other assets of the you know we're not just saying this. Here is the video footage proof. You know here you can see this happening, um, which you can use alongside. Even I've forgotten his name now. Alongside the store manager who manages this store where the, where this happened, and it makes it suddenly. Not that by just saying it, as Victoria said, it isn't believable, but you've got to back it up. Yeah. Got to be able to back it up and go, we're not just saying it. Look at this. You can physically see it yourself. And, Don't just tell me, show me as well. Yeah. Exactly. Got exactly. it. And was there anything, were there any bits of coverage, and this is a question for either of you, really, were there any bits of coverage, doesn't have to be broadcast, Victoria? Alex, it does. Uh, any bits of coverage <laughs> which really kind of stick in your mind or were you surprised by the level of interest? Obviously, we've talked about the power of the story. You do those months of prep, you know, you're confident it's going to land, but ultimately we're talking about earned media coverage. So there's confidence and there's um, results, but this this really did fly. So were you surprised about the success and or were there any bits of coverage which kind of stick in your mind? Go on, Victoria, let you go first. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, yeah, we were amazed, really, and I continue to be quite astounded by the level of um, interest in it as a story because, you know, it, it did land that day. Um, and, you know, everybody that works at PR knows the night before you've got a story to sell in and you literally, you know, it's like squeaky bum moment, isn't it? And you can't, like, you, know, you don't want to, you can't sleep. And then I wake up really early and I'm looking at my decision, like, you know, from a, uh, coverage come through to see if it's landed anywhere kind of thing and then it, it was and we knew we had BBC breakfast um locked in for that morning so I was up at the crack of dawn um and even though I am in Manchester um and we went to Media City it's still bloody early to get there but anyway you know you do it because it's BBC breakfast and it's like you know the creme de la creme isn't it um so we had that what was, um, I think, for me, that morning, uh, we had, so as Alex said, Kate Graham, who's our stores director, on the sofa with BBC Breakfast with a guy called David, who's one of our lead store managers. Um, but equally on GMB, we had Paul Gerrard, who's our, my director of uh, policy, as I mentioned earlier. He was in Good Morning Britain. So we were on both channels at the same time. And, you know, I've been doing PR for a very long time and I've never had 
to you know both sides running the same story with a, a spokesperson and um so for me um that was amazing but also it that day with all of the broadcast it just gave us a huge platform to on which to bounce from so then um i've also had some great print coverage so we did an exclusive with the sunday times where we took louise eccles um the consumer editor and she spent the day in the store in bristol and i was with her and we basically spent the day in the back office watching the cctv and she was watching some shoplifting happening live um which was really shocking for her but it you know she was able to write it in a really um touching way actually that really showed that it's um you know this isn't a victimless crime that actually the victims are the store teams um and so I was really so that you know that was really good as well and just in terms of the narrative one thing that we were really really keen to do is and this plays back a bit to us being brave is the media narrative at the time was that it was the cost of living that was meaning that people were stealing. I was going to ask you a bit about that. I was going to ask about, yeah. you know, how do you, how do you make sure this doesn't appear like a big brand that doesn't yeah. care about people? Um, yeah. How do you bring it back to the, the, the kind of severity of the situation? Yeah. It, well, to be honest, it was the evidence because the evidence is very clear that it's criminal gangs and prolific offenders. So um, we could show that, um, and you know, the CCTV, as Alex said, the footage, which was our CCTV from the stores is quite shocking some really shocking um incidents that we had and uh, and then we you know had to persuade the head of risk that it was okay for us to like use them and obviously a lot of blurred out faces and whatnot but um it really helps tell the story but it helps tell the story of our narrative which was this isn't cost of living driven this is people who are selling on to get cash for nefarious reasons so um i was really pleased that and we've managed to maintain that as a narrative and really i think change the media's perception that it, it isn't that and it, it's what we said it is well i want to come back to the kind of continued narrative because this story has run and run and i'd be yeah. interested to, to ask a bit about kind of how does that work when you're in a competitive space where you're trying to dominate share of voice but actually other retailers are actually getting involved how do you how do you not get overprotective but make sure you're all pulling towards that mission you, you mentioned at the start but um Alex just bring you in briefly because that example that Victoria gave about a print journalist observing um the the CCTV footage and actually witnessing some shoplifting there was a broadcast example of that as well if I recall is that correct it, what there was it was um it, when ICV News were filming their piece they actually had to almost stop the filming because they caught a shoplifter whilst they were filming it was going on a, a guy walked in walked past them um he put two two bottles of beer I think it was in his pocket and you can you can hear the the camera the camera lady or the or the producer just go I, I think he I think he's just shoplifted as they and they have to stop the filming and and stop him and and it, and it literally happened live as they were doing it um which which it's pretty powerful you know, stuff yeah you can't you can't engineer that just or you, shows, you know it's not yeah. made up stuff here it, it is ongoing a lot of the time and I think that, I think just going back slightly to ask whether you know we were surprised on the on the interest I th you know. No is the honest answer. Just because, mm -hmm. just because of what we had, you can you can see it. You know, when you think of the carp as a brand as well, you think you do think of communities, and they are they are in all communities. And it's but you know, people know um, whoever it might be. People know who's on who's on the tills and who's working it. People mm -hmm. they all shop in there. They all know the people that work in there. So when this happens, it's often happening to someone you know within your community. So yeah. it's so it's nice for those. For, for not just the national places, but for the local TVs as well and everything and, and everything in between. But to get on both BBC Breakfast and, and GMB, like Victoria mentioned, um, and I, th I think there were, it was BBC Radio 5 Live as well in the morning when it, when it comes to the radio, you're almost agenda setting for the day, mm -hmm. not necessarily just those print journalists, but other radios suddenly hear that and think, wow, well, you know, actually we should be doing this as well. So it just grows then throughout the day. Um, and the bit that I actually, the, the bit that I really like to remember from this as well is the ITV news piece that happened. They then shared it on their TikToks, which which then reaches reaches another audience, you know, another age of audience that are very relevant still to to the carp on their brand. And completely, and I think I don't know if you've seen the chat, Alex, but one of our one of our um uh, one of the people who've joined us kindly today has just mentioned they also heard on a podcast as well. So it just shows that multi-channel yeah 
story delivery which makes it so effective and as you say reaches either the same audience in multiple ways or different audiences yeah. because of how they index against those channels um I, i'm conscious of time so i'm going to wrap, fire off a couple more questions and then um if any of our um guests would have any questions for alex or Victoria or myself please do pop them in the chat but i'm conscious of time so i just wanted to ask a couple of things uh, we, we've alluded to the story running and running victoria so it'd be good to get a kind of an update for everyone and where we're at at the moment uh, and also i guess again reflects on something you said at the start about you know you don't always get to work on projects which can have a positive societal change so it'd be good to know kind of where are we at at the moment in that yeah. process yeah. and and as part of that how has this been received by the business internally yeah absolutely um, just before I move on to that just one thing I didn't mention which I think is really important and it was a real learning for me on this campaign is you can live or die by your spokespeople mm. Um, and that certainly was quite the case here. So we're really lucky that Paul Gerard was very keen and it's also very good as a spokesperson because, you you know, we all know that we can have spokespeople in the business, but they cannot always be the best at spokespeople duties. But we were very lucky he was very good. But we also had um, Kate and then we had um, Jenny, another our head of risk, but we also had three store managers lined up. So really, in all, we had about six spokespeople ready to go. And that... Um, it's not something I've had before. Normally we'd have got like the one, but actually we would have never, and I think Alex, you'd probably agree, we'd have never been able to do the amount of broadcast we did do on that first day if we hadn't had those spokespeople lined up. And we were able to, you want a store manager that's experienced it? Okay, here's David. You want somebody that knows about the policy? Okay, here's Paul. So that really helped. And that was a real learning for me about the, the spokespeople, how important they are, and actually having that breadth of them as well so don't put your all your eggs in one basket in one spokesperson it, it gives you those yeah. more options if yeah. I, I think I, I looked at the uh, just to remind myself i looked at the schedule earlier on today and i think itv news and lbc news again was another one that was happening i think one was a pre-record and one was like but happening at the same time because paul was on one with the case study and and then kate was also on the other yeah, one with yeah. the case study you know it, it, it gives it opens more options if you've got more voices that can take part. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was everything. So um, that's your proper question, Daniel. Sorry. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, we've obviously had that first day. It ran and ran and had a uh, lot of stuff in print. But from a broadcast point of view, we've done uh, we've done a couple more ITV newses. We've done ITV tonight, did a half hour programme um on the topic um and we were sort of like the lead feature in that so that was really good um a couple last week was it i feel like it was last week i was in a liverpool store with panorama who are doing a story not about shoplifting per se about crime in, in a different format but we fit this sort of narrative that they want to play so we that was really interesting to see how they work and um yeah but quite different but really interesting so I'll be really interested to see how they run the story um and then next week when's that expected to wear sorry uh, they think uh, either the end of December or January um yeah um and so that you know that that's been some really big hitters um next week it's respect for shop workers week which is a store who are the union that um support shop workers it's their sort of national week so it gives us another platform another opportunity so we're going to go out again but in terms of the the societal change we our aim at the start was to really raise this as an issue but and the issue is the shoplifting but the the flip of it is that the police don't respond so we know if, um we did a, an foi um and again that's a really neat kind of uh you know um way That's of getting it, yeah. evidence uh for prs um and found that 71 percent of times police don't respond when we call them to say there's a robbery going on um even when our we're in the middle we've had um one of our london stores um and paul has told this story quite a lot um they were they were ringing the police they were mid-armed robbery and they rang 999 and they said they were told that they couldn't, they weren't be able to come and maybe they should ring 101, which is like the non-urgent line. And they were having an armed robbery at the time. So our, call, our um, campaigning on the political public affairs side of things is to get police to respond more to retail crime. So we were trying to raise the issue, show it was an issue to try and drive the police to make a change to start responding. 
um, it has taken off in such a way, we thought that we'd have to phase it and we'd have to go again like next week and then probably in January and we'd start to get a bit of traction with it. What's actually happened is two weeks ago on, um, on Monday, the government um, held a meeting at number 10 of which our head of risk attended um, and several other retailers too. Um, and the policing minister announced a new retail crime action plan where they are committing the police where there has been violence or a serious offence and we have managed to detain um, so we have guards we have undercover guards and stuff now in our stores they will commit to a, to attending those incidents so um it was right. great to hear we really welcome it obviously words are one thing we need action so you know it, it's good to hear but it'd be even better to see um and so we still need to hold them to account but um for when Jenny, our head of risk, was at number 10, she uh, she report said that lots of the other retailers came to her and said thank you to us, thank you to the co-op for, for raising the issue and making such a fuss about it, basically. That's great. It driven some change. So um, as a PR, it makes me really proud to know that, you know, we, we've all had to work on campaigns where you've really had to drag a story out of it and really try and make something, you know, and land it. Um, but to have something that had real guts to it, but actually has made a real impact and made a change, you know, fingers crossed it, it will do. It's a real, it makes me you realise just how powerful PR can be. And when all the stars align and you've got everything in place, it can really be a very serious, very effective communication channel. Um you know, we've done no other marketing work on this at all. No other channel has done it. I mean, you know, our, our socials have have uh, retweeted on stuff like that when we've landed stuff, but nothing proactive. Um, so for PR to have driven this alongside the business call to action is really, um, really pleasing, really pleasing and, and, you know, really satisfying. I'd say from, from uh, one thing I've just to highlight what you said, Victoria, in the sense of being brave and having the guts to do these sorts of things, I think really it does really resonate as well when it comes to broadcast because because again, we're not just we're not just trying to do some PR. You know, we've got we have the freedom of information request. You weren't you weren't necessarily and the whole piece wasn't necessarily really trying to dig out police the police force. It wasn't anything like that. It was it was that community piece. It's going on and it needs addressing. But being brave and actually being able to do that resonates with broadcasters as well to, to bring it to life. Yeah, Brilliant. I mean, sometimes, you know, what I obviously, you know, you're going to risk it for a biscuit, haven't you? And um, so <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you just have to, like, you know, give it a go and, um, and and see. And, you know, this time we were lucky. I feel, you know, I'm not sure lucky is the right word because, you know, actually a lot of work went into it. And if it, you work hard enough, it does increase your yes, chances of being yes. lucky, I think I find. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. I think that reflection, that, that compliment of being bravery, and to your point, Alex, is that, you know, you've got to be brave in PR if you're going to, if you've got a lof lofty ambitions, you've got to be brave to meet them. And I can't think of any much better way to, to wrap this up. So I'm conscious of time. We're 35 minutes in. So if anybody has any questions that are from the viewers, from the, the guests who've kindly joined us, as I say, for Alex or Victoria about this campaign or more broadly about how to kind of make a, a pitch land, um, primarily with broadcast in mind, but but not exclusively. Please do pop them in the chat if you do. Otherwise, I will start to wrap up. Um, thank you for the comment which we did receive in the chat. Um, haven't seen anything else come in. So I would thank Anthony, Avril, Eve, uh, Florian, uh, Mark, iPhone, the mysterious iPhone, who put the uh, comment in the chat. Um, Nikki, Zoe, and uh, and anybody else that, that joined us as well. And if we don't have any questions or comments, I will thank Victoria and Alex effusively for your time. Really appreciate it. Loved working on this. I think uh, in terms of learnings, there's loads of people to take away from you got to have the right headline in the first place, then all the assets lined up behind it. Multiple spokespeople helps because they might be needed in different places at the same time, or they might resonate better with certain shows or certain stations, certain outlets. And uh, you got to risk it get a biscuit which is obviously the uh, the main outtake <laughs> <laughs> amazing thank you both thanks everybody for joining oh, oh. and we may have had a
here we go. Now, without it, as soon as, as, soon as I wrapped it up, I knew that, that somebody might pop in a, <laughs> in a comment. So there's a few thank yous. That's really, really appreciated. Thanks, Anthony. Um, and I think there is a question here from uh, Florian. I think it is. Thanks, Florian. How is best to pitch? Many people still prefer phone calls and a lot prefer an email to start with and hate cold calling. So that probably one, Alex, because you do this every day I, with your team. What's um, what's the best way to pitch? Is it, does it differ from who you're going to or is it mainly emails yeah, if you find I'd, I'd say there's, there's no set answer it, it depends on that relationship you've built up especially like for broadcast it's that relationship you build up i've got some contacts that i know would just rather i emailed them with you you know and, and, in a, and in a certain way you know tell me what you got at the top if there is b-roll or footage let me know and then and, and when it is and and they'll come back to me the way because they're great contacts there's some that what a phone call first hear about it and then if they're interested send them more of the information um so i don't think there's a set answer on that but i think in order in order to get you know that 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 mass coverage and to, and to hit all those sorts of places there's there's no harm in sending those emails and, and and then following up with people that you don't necessarily know as well because at some point you will resonate with what they want to cover and what they want to do and then you, and then you build that relationship so i know i say it's about relationships but you've got to start them somewhere as well um so I don't think there's any set answer, but you know, phone. Call, it's always nice to chat to someone on the phone. I think as well, you can you can be a bit more personal if you if you, if you get them on the phone. Yeah, we talk a lot about return investment in comms, don't we? In terms of you know the budget being invested, what are your expectations to come out of it? Whether that's outputs, outcomes, outtakes, but actually we we do talk sometimes about return on relationship when it comes to media relations as well, and mm -hmm. it's about developing that relationship. You've got to develop a credibility. So that's how and what you pitch to the right broadcasters. If you pitch the wrong thing too many times, then your credibility is gone and therefore there's no relationship there to, to leverage. But if you build up that credibility and that trust, then that's something you can. Leverage sounds opportunistic, but it's something you can benefit from in the future. Victoria, any thoughts on that? If not, there's a couple of other questions I can move on to. No, I mean, I agree. You know, relation, you know relationship PR is about relationships, isn't it? So, but, you know, like Alex says, you've got to start somewhere. And I certainly didn't know lots of people that... Um, we actually got coverage from um but and i generally email first my colleague andrew who I worked with on come in he always likes a phone call so i think it's what you sometimes what you feel comfortable with um as well um and knowing the journalist um and how they work and you know um certainly in nationals i find an email works better to, to start with just because they're so busy um um you know so yeah but relationships are other thing okay, and what i'd say is this campaign has really helped my relationships because it's really brought on some you know new and good relationships so a good campaign can really help you as a pr ongoing outside of the campaign because you, you start to build those relationships and then it helps you next time around whatever else it is you wanted to Talk that's about. a really interesting point isn't it that bravery isn't just rewarded in the moment it's rewarded potentially in the kind of medium to long term because you now have you know the, the doors more open than it when it when it was before yeah, when you come to pitch your next yeah. stories yeah and um, there's a follow-up question to that and then i'll come back to yours nikki thanks for thanks for entering that um alex from a broadcast perspective how early or how you know how, how late do you pitch the broadcast like when ideally should you be pitching and again does it vary from from program yeah to program? again there's the, the, there's no set answer for all broadcasters you, you know come on things. alex help the people <laughs> well i mean victoria just victoria mentioned earlier on um the piece would be okay with bbc panorama that they filmed two weeks ago that they're thinking is going to air in december yeah. or january um you know somewhere like bbc morning live who yes they have they have guest slots but they do those wide vt pieces as well is often you know five or six weeks in advance they can build it up gather the bits that they want and put it all together but then if you look at, you know, the likes of BBC Breakfast, if it's if it's something that's coming up where they need to prepare a bit more, you could be looking a week or two in advance. But it is they react so heavily to to the to the news that's happening right now. The same with like LBC News. Um, and quite often it can be the day before. The thing uh, the thing we love doing is is getting our we have a forward planner that goes out with with not the full information of stuff, but a small bit of information about campaigns that are coming up on certain dates. So they, so broadcasters have an idea, but, um, and, and Dan, Dan will know this, but things, things, you see a lot of movement the day before Sky News radio, for example, like to record pre-embargo the day before so that they can distribute their audio and the story at midnight, as soon as the embargo lifts for the commercial network to use, you know, and then 
other play LBC News came on, I think, sometime the day of the campaign. So the embargo is lifted, things have started happening, and they asked for an interview at 11 o'clock that morning um, to come on. So again, it's it's not set for any for all broadcasters, but often the, the, the bigger ones, it's good to have those conversations early. Let them know you've got something coming up yeah. um, and go with it there. But yeah, but prepare yourself and your client, if your agency side, for the fact that you might not get confirmation until the day before. The day before, yeah. Let this, yeah. Let this receding hairline be evidence of the stress that that leads to. Um, there's another question. Look at, look at me. <laughs> Touche. Did that be to pay? Um, there was a question earlier from Nikki as well about, um, and it, it relates to something I think you alluded to, Victoria, about maintaining or keeping momentum in a story, which has been running for a long time. You mentioned the Awareness Week, the shop, um, yeah. Respect for Shop Workers Week next week, which presumably gives you that other that next tentpole opportunity to go back out with a hook, yeah. with a reason for media to cover it. But any other thoughts on that? How do you freshen up the story? Yeah, so I mean, it's about moving the narrative on. Yeah. So our first narrative was, this is a really big issue. Everybody, look how bad it is kind of thing. So that's our first point. So then... Then we've established that. So now we're moving it on a little bit. And so we're talking about the fact that um, the police have said they're going to start responding. That's great, but we need to see it. So we're sort of moving from the issue to what a solution could be. You know, and the hope in the future is we can go back and say, actually, there has been a solution. Look, you know, our crime numbers are coming down, etc. So I think it's really important to try and build a little bit of fresh narrative each time you want to go out with a new proactive we've been lucky with this campaign is that it made such an impact that we've we've had to turn down some opportunities we had so many broadcasters coming to us saying can we do a film about going into a store following them around doing some you know filming see if we can catch a shop litter on film etc and by the time we sort of ticked off all of the main broadcasters we just felt we can't keep you know, saying the same thing. Um, and we tried to do, try and approach it in different ways. So the ITV tonight, um, the idea was there that uh, we gave like a GoPro to our store manager. And at the end of every day, he recorded what had happened that day in his store and how he felt about it and, mm-hmm. you know, um, and his feelings um, and, and stuff. So that was like one approach. Um, we did something with the Daily Mail with Harry Wallop, where we put him in a co-op fleece and shirt and shoved him out on the shop floor so he could you nice. know literally see it happening we shoved you know put him into a store that we knew had really quite bad high shoplifting um rates so it's about trying to find a different way into the story depending on the media and that gives you that bit of freshness when the actual narrative hasn't changed but then know when you've hit a limit and be brave again to make that change and stop. Don't be afraid to say no. It feels really wrong to say no when you've got a media asking for something, when you spend your life trying desperately to get the media to say yes to things. But um, yeah, just don't be afraid to, to stop, move the narrative on and then move it on again if you need to. I'm sure everybody on this call would love the luxury of turning away media I mean, requests on a regular basis. Often, but it's, a, it, it, it's a really good point, though, about kind of controlling your, you know, know when to pause to give you that opportunity to revisit. Otherwise, presumably, if the narrative is gently moving every day, then ultimately it's not significant enough of a change for people to feel it's a fresh, fresh yeah, yeah. evolution, I mean, if you like. If you've set yourself up to be, uh, to have a leadership position, mm. you, you've got to keep it fresh. Otherwise, you lose that leadership position because yep. then somebody else will come in with a fresh point of view and then you, you, you've lost it. So it's important to, to keep, you know, moving on. Yeah, nice. Um, another question as well. I think it's probably again for you, Victoria, given the volume of the breadth of, of brand spokespeople involved in this campaign, but also other campaigns you work on. Question from Avril. Thanks, Avril. How do you prepare your spokespeople? Do you have a specific media? Tra- do you have specific mm-hmm. media training for them? Uh, so it depends on the spokesperson. Yeah, I mean, we do do media training for all our sort of senior bods so that they have that in their sort of locker, um, not, sometimes not necessarily for a specific thing, but then they've got it. And then as and when we need to call them, they, they've got that sort of basis. I think as a PR, it's really important that you know your spokesperson's strengths or weaknesses. So it's for you to evaluate. So I always, always do like a practice interview with them beforehand um, to make sure that they, they're good enough. 
really, you know, um, and also that they know what they're talking about. Um, so, you know, we're lucky again, Paul, who we use our most votes person has a real passion for this and is really um, an expert. But then a couple of the others, um, and if you imagine the store managers, they are, you know, David in Leeds it is a co-op store manager and he's n never done media before. So um, I'll give you a little insight. He was doing BBC Breakfast that first day with Kate Graham. Um, and his wife was working and it was his day to look after his two little girls. Um, and that was that. They didn't have any childcare. So bless him. He left Leeds at something like four o'clock in the morning where he lives to come to Media City in Manchester. And he brought his two little girls with him. Wonderful. So we're, I'm standing behind the scenes holding two little girls' hands behind the cameras at BBC Breakfast while their dad's on the sofa talking to Naga about store crime. They're the things you have to like work with. But, you know, beforehand I'd sat down with him and we had like practice. And, you know, if they ask you this, think about saying that and that kind of thing. So, yeah, prep is really important. Um, uh, but also you, you've got to let them speak in their own way, too, because if you try and give them too many fixed answers, they yeah. fall over their words and then was, they sound weird as well. I was, was going to say that you don't expect a shop manager to be totally polished from a media training perspective no. you know, and you don't want him be... to be because you want him to sound real completely, completely. I think that, that, like, see Alex has got a question was okay. I was gonna is he gonna ask as a parent Alex is gonna ask how on earth did he get two young kids up <laughs> at four in the morning without going on holiday or it being Christmas it McDonald's. might be a different question was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I was just gonna say I think I think and you sort of touched on it I think it's different for the type of spokesperson you've got broadcasters would expect someone like Paul and Kate to to know all the information to be quite polished to 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 know the ins and outs the, and, and the depth of the campaign, whereas David, the shop, the, the store manager, is is you all right, and you want that to come across. He's he's the he's the relatable one that brings it back to that your friend in in the local carp store. So uh, you, as much as it's, I'd say when it comes to those sorts of people, it's it's less media training and more reassuring of how it's going to be and what it's going to be like. Yeah. Um, yeah, to, to, to that end as well. Sorry, I was just going to say for any for anybody, anybody on here who is or can get to London relatively easily, we're doing an intro to broadcast workshop on December the 7th. There's a couple of spaces left, I think. Feel free to drop me a note afterwards if you're interested in attending. But that involves an immersive studio experience. So even if you're not going to be a spokesperson yourself, if you're in comms and you've never been into a studio, it's quite hard to prepare or accommodate a spokesperson into studio when it's the first time you've ever done it yourself whereas if you've done it yourself we do mock interviews in our tv studio radio and podcast studio and it just gives you that first-hand experience so you can talk confidently to a potential spokesperson about what it's like to put the cans on to hear the talk back uh, the difference between a live and a prereq beyond the obvious how to prep for a news interview versus a, a feature interview so if that's of interest to anybody on here please drop me a note after this um we'll have another event i think in the new year if, uh, if there's no spaces left but yeah drop me a note I'll see if we can. Uh, Shana, my team came down to the last one of that. And she found it really interesting um, and uh, informed. She'd not really done too much broadcast before. She said she scared right. us to death because she had to do an interview. <laughs> <laughs> but she learned loads from it. So, you know, be brave. That's our motto for today, isn't it? Be brave. Be brave, <laughs> definitely. Nice. Um, I think we'll probably wrap it up there. And I'm conscious of the time. Everyone stayed stayed to the end. So I really appreciate everyone's engagement and the questions we had submitted. Um, Nikki, Avril, Florian, um, Harriet, thanks so much for those questions. If anybody does have any comments, thoughts afterwards, please feel free to get in touch with myself. I can uh, potentially put you in touch with Victoria Ikes or see if I can help myself. But uh, yeah, massive thanks for you guys. Um, relatively short notice, I think, on the event coming to Zoom. So appreciate everyone's flexibility. And uh, yeah, we appreciate the feedback as well. Much appreciated. Thanks so much, all. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.